you know, that's, that's good. I, I love that. I love that type of weather. It's, yeah. Uh, it... yeah. You froze. Are you? <laughs> it's my favorite time of day. It's sunny. Can you see me? There you go. I can there see. We are. Can you see there me? Are. Yes, I can. Excellent. You froze Excellent. for a moment. <laughs> Uh, I think we are live right now, which is okay. which is a very good thing. So, yeah. uh, hello everybody. Uh, my name is. Do Dominic Boyajan, uh, music director of Clean Opera Theater, well, uh, 101 Maestro's Corner, like every Friday at 12:15. Today we have a very special person. We have a VIP. She's a VIP in my life, and she's a VIP in the opera world. Uh, Corey Ellison, welcome. Thank you. Very happy to be here. So, Corey, you are. Um, so, let's go through all the things that you that you do. It's a lot <laughs> easier for me to tell people what you don't do. <laughs> let let just let just say what you do. Well. Um, I mean, I'm a dramaturg, and um, I wish I had a nickel for every time people asked, what is a dramaturg, and what does a dramaturg do? But um, if, You are a dramaturg. For I, I am a dramaturg, yes. And, um, you know, that is a, a really big umbrella term that uh, encompasses a lot of different uh, aspects. So... Mo I, Basically, um, a dramaturg for an opera company or for a particular project would be more or less, you would say, a scholar in residence for the company or the project. Someone who would do mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of scholarly research, but to apply in a really practical way, working with the directors, designers, conductors on new productions and also these days, very importantly, and, and much of the work that I do in the past 10 years or so has been working with composers and librettists on developing new operas that are being yeah. commissioned. Yeah, it's a, that's so, actually something that I would like to yeah, talk about, we'll talk about uh, that. later because I'm very interested on the subject. You are the yeah. perfect person to, <laughs> to ask these questions. So, so we definitely have to uh, touch on those. Uh, and then the other uh, things, you know, uh, just to, to continue <clears throat> that a dramaturg would do for a project uh -huh. or a company usually would involve uh, curating um, publications and educational programs and also uh, participating in them. So those are more or less, you know, can also involve uh, writing and queuing super titles, which I've done quite which a bit of. Yeah, yeah quite a bit, quite a bit. Uh, but not only you are a dramaturg, you uh, serve on the faculty of the Juilliard School uh, Vocal Arts Institute and American Lyric Theater. And you also served as staff dramaturg for New York City Opera, Santa Fe, Santa Fe Opera, and Glyndebourne. Yes, uh, oh, very proudly. <laughs> oh, and and they were lucky to have you. Let me just, <laughs> let me just say that. However, you are also a singer. Yeah, that's my, my dirty little secret. I mean, <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't have said it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, yeah, it, no, that's my background, of totally. Course. Yeah, of course. Uh, and then, as you mentioned, you do you do titles uh, for many companies, including the Met. Uh, you, I think, I believe you worked on the Times and uh, other publications. I've written uh, as, a freelancer, uh, as a freelancer a lot for the New York Times and other other publications. Yeah, uh, and then you speak multiple languages. Uh, you it's have very varying degrees of, of fluency, but but I read and write them really well. Exactly. So with all the titles and all the languages that you get in, uh, that you get uh, you know uh, in front of uh, the knowledge that you have is just absolutely unbelievable. Okay. Uh, one of the things that I always told you, you just have the memory of, I, I of a wizard. I, I, I don't know how to describe it. You just remember everything. <laughs> well, I have, I have a, an old friend that, that always said, don't ever tell Corey anything you don't want her to remember. <laughs> it's true. 
It's true. So, like, um, I'm just so, trying to keep the memory up as, as we age, you know, trying to <laughs> those, keep those brain cells lively. But, but you know what, that's, that's also what, um, uh, what people are seeking from you. It's, uh, it adds to the knowledge that you already have of, of opera, of, of, of singers, of productions. And on top of that, if you add the things that you remember, it's just, it just, you know, uh, it puts in a very beautiful packed box. That's why people are always coming after you in, in a good way. I mean, in a good way, they, they always want you, they always want you to be, to be part of their, uh, of their, of their company. Anyway, I've been very lucky and I hope it continues. I always will. Yes, it will. Uh, Corey, even though these days, these days are a little tough on, on, on a lot of people, uh, especially the ones that are affected, uh, uh, physically, uh, health wise by, by this horrible thing. Yeah. Uh, which brings me to ask you, are you okay? Have you been safe? Yes, I'm very lucky, very, very lucky to have, have kept safe and healthy and all of my loved ones and close people also. So good. Thank yeah. God. That's, yeah. that's the most important thing. Yeah. Cannot um, be taken for granted. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so you already told us pretty much, I mean, it's very difficult to describe what a dramaturg does if, if, if you are either not one or not in the business. It, us, uh, I, I know exactly what you do and how important your, your role is in any production, whether standard rep or, or, or new rep. I mean, you're, I think you're essential. Oh. Uh, but did you grow up wanting to be a dramaturg? <laughs> Does Corey Ellison, hey, I'm six years old. I'm going to become a dramaturg. <laughs> well, um, I think if I had known at the age of six what a dramaturg was, I might well have said that at the age of six. <laughs> but I mean, what, what I consider is that I was born a dramaturg, but I only found out much later because again, I had no, I, I never heard of it. I had no idea what it was, but um, I mean, I got into opera at the age of seven, it really by accident. I found uh, a couple of Mario Lanza singles. Nice that had belonged to my late grandfather. And, um, and I listened to them and I, I would just like rocked my world. That was it. I mean, I just, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to like it. You know, I <laughs> had no prejudices, but it uh -huh. just blew me away. You know, it was uh, uh, Osole Mio, Matinata, uh -huh. Uh, Granada and Lolita <laughs> and section. they just it just blew me away and literally from that minute on I knew this was somehow going to be my life I had no idea how uh, and I just I followed that I, I just never stopped following it and it's kind of crazy sometimes because I made some impractical decisions based on <laughs> all of but us did I wouldn't do it over again any yeah. other way because it, it's led to such an incredibly rich life. So the, 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 the music? People, the music, mm -hmm. yeah, the music. So was it the music that hit you or was it his voice? Well, both, okay. both. I mean, it was a, a confluence and it was just, yeah. uh, so from that point on, you know, so I started uh, studying acting and singing, and that's what I uh, concentrated on in school um, at Hofstra University, which is a great theater school. I was a, a theater arts major and a music minor. And then I went to Manhattan School of Music as a voice major. Yep. Because, you know, the, what I knew at that time is I thought, well, if I'm into opera, then I'll be a singer, you know, and, um, you know, I was I, a pretty good singer. I shouldn't say was because <laughs> one never stops being That's a right. singer. That's right. Absolutely. And I, I think I, I still see the world through the eyes of a performer, mm -hmm. which uh, I think gives me a lot of empathy for performers, which I think is, is a good thing. Uh, but as I went through, you know, I, I finished school and I started on the aspiring young singer track mm -hmm. and did apprenticeships and gigs. And, and the more I was around 
uh, the profession, the more I saw that my personality was a bit different from uh, many singers in that I loved best the big picture. I didn't love so much being in a practice room for hours and, and just concentrating on the voice. Um, I was interested in, you know, researching the background and, you know, translating and, and I did all of those things sort of uh, on, on, as, a, as side hustles, you know, I translated and I wrote program notes and, uh, and, and I used to kind of resent that I got gigs doing that more easily than, yeah. than singing. But, you know, I was kind of the 11th pretty good mezzo from the left, you know, but <laughs> I, I was, yeah. But, you know, the other thing, there was more of a supply and demand thing. So, mm -hmm. but, but gradually I came to see that uh, I loved the big picture and that I felt I could have more of an impact on the profession uh, in doing those, those kinds of ancillary things. And then I discovered my first dramaturg. It was Nicholas John, who was the longtime dramaturg at English National Opera. Mm -hmm. And uh, on my first trip to England, I was able to meet him through a mutual friend and follow him around on his rounds for a day at ENO. And uh, I just said, this is, this is my job. This is what I want to do. So it barely existed in the US at the time in opera. It's always existed in regional theater. So, but I kind of came back to the US and decided I was gonna will this into, into being, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, because, uh, and I, I kind of, at least for myself, I've done that. And now I'm very dedicated to educating the future opera dramaturgs. And we're, we're doing that at American Lyric Theater. It's the first program of its kind in the US. Uh, we have- yeah, tell two, us a little bit, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, we have two, absolutely fantastic uh, dramaturgy fellows. Mm -hmm. um, Hannah McDermott, who is a, a graduate of Juilliard as a singer, and that's uh -huh. how I knew her, and Kate Pitt, who is a, a wonderful theater professional. Mm -hmm. So they, they come at it from different sides, but uh, I have high hopes for both of them. They're already doing really great work. That's great. Yeah, and I'm very, I'm really proud of them. That's and I, I'm also very grateful to uh, Larry Edelson, who is the founder and the uh, producing artistic director of ALT, where I also have for a long time been uh, teaching the uh, resident artists who are composers and librettists, helping to teach them how to write operas. Yeah, that must, uh, that must not be uh, an easy thing. I mean, uh, people, People are very creative and you have to, uh, uh, you know, uh, invade their creativity, but at the same time, you, you kind of have to expand it. You have to put water on the plant. Oh yeah. And the plant has to grow by itself. Yeah. So it's- uh, yeah. And, I, and watering the plants in this uh, profession is one of my uh, favorite and, and most important things to do. I, I also, uh, teach singers. <laughs> uh, I teach mm -hmm. a, a, another a course at Juilliard um, called History of Singing, mm -hmm. which is a, a required course for fourth year undergraduate singers. I see. Uh, and then I also uh, this year began teaching Opera Lab at Juilliard, which is sort of a... I want to know about that. Tell us yeah. about that. What well, um, some student composers at Juilliard in, in recent years have been interested in writing opera. And so they were doing that on an extracurricular basis. They just sort of got together. Uh, but then uh, the uh, artistic director of the Vocal Arts Institute at Juilliard, Brian Zeger, thought that it's something that its time had come to be curricularized. So um, I'm very thrilled that he called upon me uh, to create this new class 
and we have an enrollment of uh, currently four composers. Nice. Yeah, a pianist, four singers, and a director. Wow. And, and we have uh, two librettists who are not students, but who are my co-teachers. Uh, one of them is Hannah McDermott, my, um, my dramaturg apprentice from ALT, and the other, John De Los Santos, who's an extremely gifted librettist and director. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're sort of this team that, uh, you know, we, we teach curriculum uh, about composing opera. We have guests in from all, uh, all segments of the opera world. And most importantly, they write and develop uh, new pieces. Right now we're working up on four 20 minute operas, which we're gonna present when things start to go back to normal, um, mm -hmm. hopefully in, in the fall semester sometime. So how does, how does the process of, uh, of creating a new opera begin? What, what is step one and what is step one? Well, uh, step, I mean, first of all, a composer um, is commissioned or, or sometimes composers and librettists undertake a project uh, just out of a desire to do it and they like it. look yeah. for a commission. Uh, you know, it can, sometimes a composer can come to me and say, hook me up with a librettist or sometimes a librettist comes and says, hook me up with a composer or sometimes. So the first thing that you do is find a subject if that's not already been done. And then you sit, you know, as a dramaturg, I sit with the composer and the librettist once they have a subject and help them draft what we call a treatment, which is like the blueprint for a building, like the skeleton of, mm -hmm all of you know the plot laid out in very uh, specific terms to create the dramatic arc. What's the inciting incident? What is the rising action? What is the climactic? Oh, I love it. I and love it. What is the denouement, you know? Uh -huh. uh, so that you don't want to start building the building, putting the bricks on and the mortar until you have the frame, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's exactly what you do with an opera. Once that is done, then the librettist can go away and start writing the libretto. Then you come back together uh, with the composer and we go through that and, and usually go through a couple of drafts to make sure it's what they want and need and it's clear. Mm -hmm. Then you'll usually have a, um, a libretto reading uh, for, for the public. Uh, and then what, what we do at American Lyric Theater and what I do in my independent projects is also have a, uh, an audience response, a, a mo moderated audience response. We use the Liz Lerman method, which uh, elicits constructive criticism. And, you know, it's a very uh, tightly monitored process for getting constructive criticism mm -hmm. and then uh, after after that there's usually more revision of the libretto and then the composer goes away and starts writing the music then we all come together again and go through some drafts of that and at that point we have a piano vocal workshop where we bring in singers and, and a music director and do usually rehearse and then do a public or semi-public reading, first reading of a piece. Mm -hmm. And again, the critical response process and some more revision. And then uh, if it's possible, sometimes it's a luxury once it's orchestrated and you don't wanna orchestrate until the piece is, is pretty set because once things are orchestrated, you know, it's like pulling a thread out of a tapestry. Yeah. <laughs> you, yeah. don't, you don't want to mess with it. Um, but then, you know, to have an orchestral workshop with with feedback and, and uh, public, uh, you know, audience. Mm -hmm. And then it's ready to go into rehearsal and be born to the whole world. Yeah. So very exciting. That yeah. process can take 
anywhere from two to four years, all of that from uh, the seed to the opening night. And it's different all the time. It's a, a chemical reaction between the creative personalities. Yeah, uh, and, and, and I'm glad we are talking about this because uh, uh, we, we do a lot of new works here in Cleveland. We are interested in doing a lot of new works. Uh, uh, opera is not just old, but it's new. It's like every form of art. It's like life. Life is old and life is new. So there's absolutely no difference between the two. Uh, but I, I'm, uh, I'm, I really want our uh, audience to understand how long it takes to put something together from scratch, uh, yeah. how much work it involves to get all these creative minds together. And they are not like sometimes people imagine us like uh, we are crazy geniuses <laughs> with white hair sticking out. Well, uh, these days, a, a lot of people have white hair sticking out. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> you know? That's a good point. <laughs> that's a good point. But yeah. we also have to be very organized. We also have yeah. to be very business oriented uh, because without those qualities, there, there's uh, creativity means nothing. Absolutely. It just, it just means nothing. Absolutely. So one thing uh, I, I wanted to just throw in though yeah. is you know, we, we always read about how people like Rossini and Mozart wrote operas in two weeks or a month or so, you know, and that's something that can never happen nowadays. And it's not because we got dumber or something. Mm -hmm. It's just that it's a whole different ball game. In those days, operas were written very much according to strict formulae. Yeah. And that's something we don't have. You know, one of the, the only generalizations you can make about new opera is that you can't make any generalizations there you know there's a plurality of styles and methods um and and you, every time you start you start from scratch as you said that's yeah. what it takes as long as it does and uh, please feel free to add to this but one of the things since you brought it up one of the things that made these composers so incredible in so many ways is that they knew the structure they knew the building and all the rooms and somehow they were able to add and break and just color in a different way yeah. and produce things that were fresh exactly. even out of those formulas it's amazing it exactly. truly is. So, so that that's that's the greatness that we always talk about these composers the greatness uh, let, let's talk about brahms for a second where he took the sonata form Everything is classical, everything is perfect, yeah. but everything is messed up on the inside. I mean, the box is the same and it's the same length. Yeah. But it's so different on the inside. Yes. You know, yeah. uh, Mozart in the finale, finale primo of uh, Merge of Figaro. Oh. Uh, you know, it's, yeah. it's incredible. You know, remember in the movie Amadeus, yes. how he explained it to the uh, emperor? Yes. Uh, it's such a great scene. Say, like, I'm adding two singers and then a third one and then a fourth one. And we do 20 minutes of uninterrupted music, which was mind blowing at the time. Mm -hmm. And it's still mind blowing. It's it's incredible. It's yeah. absolutely incredible. If you just know, that's what he, that's why history is so important. If you just know where we were yesterday, then you can definitely understand what's going on today and how great it is or not great sometimes you know yeah oh you're so, so right i'm like so on board with that it's 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 yeah. incredible what's out there and and it's so exciting and and i guess what you do and what i do uh it's for money right well uh, <laughs> we do have to eat <laughs> you know uh, We'd love no. to give it away for free, but we we do have to eat. But 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 we can both agree that we did not go into this profession to make to to be rich. No, you know? so it's not. Yeah, it, 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 I if, think it's if being rich, you're, yeah. I mean, there's probably you know a, a top five percent yeah. of our uh, profession that makes you know very uh, that gets rich. <laughs> But uh, but it's a calling. Would you describe it as a calling for oh, all of us? Very much so. Very much. It, it, so. it just yeah. got to be. It yeah. has to be. Yeah. So uh, we were just talking about new opera. Um, 
I know the answer to this, but I would like to hear it from you. Is new opera relevant today? <laughs> in which way? And do you think that the word opera gets in the way? <laughs> well, um, you know, I'm, uh, you know, there's a lot of like euphemistic, I mean, I, I've, I've given lectures in places where you're not allowed to call it a lecture, you have to call it like an enrichment program. Oh, seriously? You know, oh, yeah, oh, you know, and, and I mean, okay. come on, it, it you know, okay. uh, so opera, you know, I think, first of all, its relevance never ends, you know, uh, and I think it's new opera is very important, first of all, because uh, it's being statistically shown that new audiences, and we desperately need new audiences, uh, are interested in new opera. Why? Because they want to see things in their own language, uh, often that use uh, their own familiar musical idioms, their own stories. They want to see themselves portrayed on stage. Uh, and this, you know, doing that in the form of opera can bring new audiences. It was interesting as I think you and I and people older than us came to opera as something aural through our ears. Uh, that's, you know, Absolutely. but I think it's very different nowadays what with the HDs and the films and telecasts. Uh, people, more audiences are coming to opera as a theatrical art form. And we need to respond to that uh, with really fine quality productions of canonic repertory and also with creating new operas that uh, are very mindful of that. Um, so, so I think, I agree. Yeah, yeah. So you're saying that today is, is, is very much visual. So we, we shouldn't probably shy away from not so much visual, but dramatic, you know, in other words, that a part of it too is, uh, I'm sorry to say that, as we all know, music education in this country has uh, suffered a lot in the past decades. And so people are, uh, most people are less able to grasp uh, immediately the musical greatness of something, um, at, at least on a technical level. You know, of course, you can hear beautiful music. You don't have to have a music degree to know that Puccini is beautiful or Verdi right. is beautiful. Right. But you know what I mean? It can Absolutely. be an acquired taste these days when there's this hegemony of pop music. But, uh, you know, drama is something that I think is, is a little bit more accessible. It's like people go to movies, people watch TV, people go to the spoken theater. It's something you don't have to know anything to, yeah. to digest. Exactly. That's one reason why opera has... Uh, new audiences for opera are coming to it as a theatrical art form. Yeah. Should we look for new audiences or young audiences or both? Because those are two different things. Yeah, they are. But we should look for all audiences. Mm -hmm. We should, I mean, really, we should reach out. And it's my firm belief that whether it's new opera or a, a canonic existing opera, all that you need to, tr to attract new audiences is two things, is uh, access, which is, you know, make it available to people mm -hmm. in a way that they can afford and they can access. And most importantly, quality. Because I firmly believe that no matter what it is, if it's Wozzeck, you know, uh, yep. if it's uh, Otello, you know, if it if it's così fan tutte, if it's done well, people cannot help but respond to it. I absolutely so firmly believe that. Like one thousand percent. I'm getting so many people that that come to me after performances, like in awe, shocked at their own selves. 
uh -huh. because yeah. they just couldn't believe that they would enjoy something in yeah. another language, something that they have never experienced before. And I said, uh, but did you like it? I said, yes, very much. That's it. Uh -huh. that, that, that's all you need. You have all the necessary tools inside of yourself from day one yes. to being able to appreciate anything in life. Either you appreciate it or right. you don't. It, I think that it's that simple. Yes. You know, you don't have to explain to me why you liked it. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm doing it for you. Not It's, it's not a lecture. It's not uh, a music uh, exercise where you come to me and say, why did you like it, John? Did you enjoy the first violins? No, this it has nothing to do with that. It's yeah. just you are my audience. I'm, 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 I'm and it struck something in you. Whether, right. yeah, it, it touched something in you. It made you feel something. That's right. That's yeah. right. I, and all of us have our own way of of judging if we like something or not. I usually have goosebumps yeah. out of the blue for even an art form that I'm not familiar with. So I'm, I'm, I'm telling myself, hold on a second. My body right now is telling me and my mind and my soul is telling me that I'm liking this. Yeah. So I'm trying to connect to my brain and say, hello, brain. Let's try <laughs> to understand what the other parts of your body are trying to tell you right now. You know, but, but it starts from here. And it's a very interesting yeah. experience for me when that happens, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, my goodness, I, mean, I have so many things that I want to ask you, and, and we don't have hours here. We absolutely don't. Um, awesome. So let me ask you this. So since we started talking about audience members, uh, uh, I, I get a lot of questions that are extremely difficult to answer, which are, uh, what's your favorite composer? What's your favorite symphony, opera? I mean, it's just impossible. It's just impossible to, to, to answer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to ask you the opposite of that, uh, not what's the worst, but <laughs> in, uh, in, 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 in your own dra dramaturg world, writer, a singer, your experience, um, what does it mean this is a challenging opera? Which, which of all operas of the standard repertoire out there oh. are challenging for Corey Ellison? Well, for any dramaturg or, or really any uh, conductor or director or a company approaching them, two of really the greatest operas ever are the, the most, uh, hands down, I think, the most challenging to put on. Uh, and those are uh, The Tales of Hoffmann mm -hmm. and Don Carlos of Verdi. And the reason is the same, well, not exactly the same, but similar for both of them, is that um, for both of these operas, uh, they exist in a number of different editions. There is a multiplicity of materials um, that exist, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, you, you have to, before you put on a production of it, you have to decide what, you're going to do. It's not like Bohem where you open up the score and Bohem is Bohem, you know? Mm -hmm. No, it's like uh, you have to decide, uh, you know, for instance, uh, Tales of Hoffmann, uh, Offenbach died before it was finished. And so, for instance, the Venetian act is uh, just a fragment. And other composers and producers came in and pulled things from other ones of his operettas because it was his only opera mm -hmm. and you know he was a composer of like you know just frivolous really funny witty wonderful operettas yeah. all his life and his magnum opus was this what he wanted to be a grand opera which is the it, it has its light moments but yeah. it is the most serious uh moving contemplation of an artist's relationship to their muse mm -hmm. and uh, both literally and figuratively. So, you know, but he, he had different versions of different movements and he had 
a bunch of extra arias that were lost, but then rediscovered at a certain point in the late 20th century. And, you know, you cannot possibly do a production of Hoffman using all of the existing materials. A, it would be as long as Gitter Dameron. <laughs> and B, you would have the same things over again, you know, like two versions of the same uh, piece. Mm -hmm. and, and it wouldn't make dramatic sense. Uh -huh. So you have to really choose. In the case of Don Carlos, he, uh, Verdi wrote it as a French opera for yeah. the, the Paris opera mm -hmm. in the proper five act format. That's right. Uh, and then, and it was quite long, mm -hmm. and then uh, produced a, a, a version for Italy, which he knew that the Italians, with all due respect, have <laughs> less have less what we call zitzfeich <laughs> <laughs> and he pared it down and kind of you know you know mixed and matched things got rid of the first act more or less but took things from the first act and put it later on and so on and, and then he revised it and also Don Carlos is sort of in a way uh one of the two culminations of this period in Verdi's life where he was absorbing the influence of French grand opera a la Meyerbeer and, and kind of combining the uh, political aspects of his earliest operas, mm -hmm. uh, the, the political epics with the more personal stories of his second period operas like Traviata and, and Rigoletto and uh, making this big canvas where what you have is an intimate, like let's say a love triangle that is intensified because every move that these people make has an effect on nations. Uh -huh. You know, they're kings or princesses or, and, and they can't make a move without thinking of millions of other people. So uh, Don Carlo, uh, or Don Carlos in the French version yeah. is such an opera. And it is Verdi's most sprawling kind of, you know, messy opera, yeah. but, but in a lot of ways, I think the greatest. And then he went on, the opera after that is Aida. Uh -huh. has, Aida has this virtually the same form, but it's clean as a whistle. There's not an ounce of fat on it. It's like he solved all the problems of Don Carlos in Aida. But to me, Don Carlos is always the more interesting piece because it's so problematic and so heartfelt. Um, anyway, I'm sorry, I went off on a no, big no, tangent there. I but. love that, that, you know, I, I just love to hear <laughs> everything that you have to say. It's, it's so interesting. It's so interesting. Uh, in fact, uh, it's funny you mentioned it, that, that, that you mentioned Verdi because it's our Verdi month. So we feature a different composer every month. And we started with the greatest, I, it's tough to say, you know, uh, but uh, as, as, you, as you can confirm, the journey that this man had from age 11 when he was playing organ uh, in the church across from the house where he was born yeah. until his last opera is yeah. <clears throat> mind blowing. It is, it it's, is. And it's the most, uh, I think of any composer, you can really trace his progress yeah. through the operas themselves and through his correspondence yeah. that you can really see the process of his development. And that, fact, that in itself is a treasure. But you mentioned it going from uh, Don Carlo to Aida. In Aida, he solved the problems from the previous opera yeah. and he continued mm -hmm. doing so from, uh, from, from he, he always did that from the beginning yeah. until the end, where Absolutely. at the end he sounds like, uh, oh, this, this sounds like Puccini. Uh, yeah. And at the beginning, uh, this mean, sounds like a, a, a town band and it, there's nothing yeah. there's nothing wrong with that no. this this is what he was exposed to yeah. this is what he was composing for yeah, yeah. and I, I just I mean, it, he brought it from if you think about it you know he brought it from the era of Donizetti 
you know, his, his early operas are very much in the Donizetti mold up to the ear of Puccini, you know? Uh, and and it's, it's like all the development of Italian opera in the 19th century occurs through Verdi. Not that other people weren't writing opera, but no, no, exactly. that the progress occurs through Verdi. So would you say that's one of his, uh, was one of his greatest qualities, like how he, uh, how he grew as a musician yeah. or, or would you pick something else? Well, I mean, there's that, there's the growth as a musician and the, the growth of the, of the art form through him. And the fact that he kind of answered Wagner saying, well, you know, we can make just as sophisticated uh, an opera sticking to the Italian version, yep. the Italian model, as, as you can with your different uh, methods. Uh, but, but also um, the beauty of the music, just the sheer moving, visceral beauty of the music and the incredible humanity of, of the man, which comes Amen. across in the music. There's is just the depth of feeling and, and the ability to, I, you know, kind of identify with and, and sound the human condition. Uh, very few composers, Mozart does that too, uh, but it's, it's so rare and so precious. Yeah, he was he he was really able to grab the humanity, the, the same way that Puccini was able to grab to understand theater, yeah. like no one else. Yeah, uh, yeah. Giuseppe Verdi uh, was 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 able to grab the soul, yeah. put it to music, understand words. Right. We don't need ten words; we need one. La parola scenica. <laughs> there you go. There yeah. you go. And we are just going to put a chord under that uh, that word, and it's going to be nice and clean and lean, and, you know? and rip your heart out. <laughs> what what an incredible, an incredible guy! Unbelievable! Wow, yeah. um, Corey, I have uh, two two fun questions uh, to oh, ask you. Okay, <laughs> I hope they're fun for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Good point. Uh, because I know that time, time, time is going by. I will talk to you for a week, 24 hours a day, but. Uh, yeah, it sounds good to me. <laughs> you, you, you have, uh, you're a busy woman. The, 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 I'm going to call you and we're going to talk for 24 hours a day for, for, for a whole week. That's what we're going to do. Sounds uh, good. So let's play, let's play a little game that we're going to start today. Uh, and the game is uh, Opera Desert Island with a twist. With a twist? <laughs> Okay, what's the twist? So the twist is that we have to bring someone back to life. So if oh. you if you were to bring on this desert island of your choice, uh, your favorite libretto. Oh wow! Your favorite recording, <laughs> and your favorite singer that is no longer with us today oh my god who would they be oh gosh just one i mean i'm just gonna have to be very like random like like stream of consciousness because yeah, yeah sure too many course. but you don't win you don't lose anything with this game so all don't... right so i would have to say uh the libretto i would have to say falstaff nice uh, boito <laughs> it's just it's brilliant in every way good you know? choice uh-huh it, it's a, a brilliant adaptation because it's not a slavish adaptation. It, 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 uh, he takes, Boito takes the <clears throat> Shakespeare, Merry Wives of Windsor, one of the inferior plays of Shakespeare, uh -huh. actually. And, it's just... and knows, not only knows how to make it into an opera, which is a different animal, but also brings other pieces of Shakespeare into it. Sonnets, even a piece from the Decameron not by Shakespeare, by Boccaccio, uh, you know, excerpts from the Henry plays makes a masterpiece. Genius. For, for Verdi to build on. Genius. Yeah. I love it. Absolutely. I love it. And for recording, for I mean, well, what pops into my mind because of that is uh, the Toscanini recording of Falstaff, nice. which, which is, wow. oh, you know, I mean, 
Toscanini just got it, you know, really. He understands. He just understands yeah. how it's yeah. supposed to be done. So yeah. for the people that are listening to us and want, and want to hear it, do you happen to remember which year or approximately what year? Uh, it's from the 1950s and it okay. was on RCA. Okay. Uh, and it's very much available. I know it, it's certainly on Spotify. Yeah. Uh, and you can buy it, you know, um, on, uh, you know, any place like, you yeah. know, Amazon or Amazon, something. Like that. Sure. It, thank goodness, very much available. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Very good. How about a favorite singer? Oh, gosh. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I suppose I would have to say, I mean, you know, I would have to say Maria Callas because she's just everything. She's the most all-encompassing I, you know, just a, an incredible artist who really, I think, revolutionized opera in the 20th century. She brought back a, a whole repertory that had been neglected, bel canto. Mm -hmm. and, and she also uh, brought us a new standard of performing opera. Uh, she raised the stakes for acting and interpretation. And uh, she left us such a legacy of, I never, of course, got to hear her live, but, um, you know. and I think she was probably a very interesting human being, a very complex human being, but very smart and very interesting. I remember when talking to my dad about opera, how he would melt uh, when he, he would talk about her and, and watch a few videos. And when I was talking to him, like, 20 years ago, uh, there wasn't YouTube or anything like that. So if, if there was something on TV that he would want me to watch, he says, come, come and watch this, look for this, listen to that. Uh -huh. he, would just, he would just melt and he didn't do it for every singer, no. he didn't, you know, <laughs> including himself. He was very, he was very, you know, uh, what's the term I'm looking for? Uh, 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 critical. Self-critical. Exactly. Well, he was a pretty great singer. And as you know, I did have a chance to hear him, uh, which I'm very glad, you know, I'm very glad that I did. Yeah, my dad. Very, very, you know, real Verdi baritone, very special. Thank you. Yeah. I, I know he appreciates it. I know he appreciates it. <laughs> uh last question Corey. uh just just to get to know you very briefly uh, <laughs> on top of what you already told us if Corey ellison didn't become a dramaturg what was Corey ellison uh, what, what was she gonna do in life oh gosh well um i mean you know i was studying to be a singer uh, <laughs> so i probably would have ended up being you know a singer who works not a superstar but a, a well-regarded singer who works uh, when I was a little kid, I had periods of wanting to be an astronaut <laughs> or a doctor, you know, uh, a, a newspaper reporter, which I have been actually, you know, I have been a journalist. Nice. Uh, so you have a few things that you wanted to do. Yeah. Or, or the, also the ultimate escape fantasy to be a chef, of course. Me too. That's even more difficult. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you know. Exactly. It, it, but Twelve it, hours in the kitchen, in the heat, everybody's screaming at each other. At least that, that's how I imagine it. Yeah. In my own, in my own mind. Right. Right. So. But I do love to cook. Yeah, <laughs> and that's I know one you do. thing that the pandemic has given us all a chance to cook a little more. That's right. And look for new recipes, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Corey uh thank you thank oh. you so much for for talking for taking time to, to talk to me to 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 us uh here in cleveland uh you're wonderful you're right wonderfully you talk wonderfully you know everything uh you have been most importantly you have been a very good friend oh, uh, you are vice versa. <laughs> one of my top five friends oh uh, i love you dearly and I love uh, you too. and uh Thanks so much for, for oh. just giving us your time. I oh, really my it. great pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's been really fun. Wonderful. Let's do it again soon. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Corey. <laughs> Bye.